People who purport to speak on behalf of science and then defend the corruption of science for political gain need to be exposed as the political demagogues that they are. And of course, I'm talking about Potholer 54. Political demagogue? Moi? Ooh. I have to say, my channel has always steered well clear of politics, and if I am pushing a political point, I'm doing a pretty shitty job of it, because no one seems to know what my politics are. Several people have taken a guess, but they've all been wrong. The reason I don't proclaim my politics is that this is a channel about science, and far from defending the corruption of science, just about every video I put out is attacking the corruption of science, and so is this one. Now, while some of you may think that scientific facts are dependent on politics, funnily enough, they're not. But of course, that doesn't stop politicians from trying to invent a version of science that fits their own political, religious or ideological preferences. I'm sure we all remember this famous nugget from Sarah Palin on the subject of fruit fly research. Sometimes these dollars, they go to projects having little or nothing to do with the public good. Things like fruit fly research in Paris, France. I kid you not. Just in case you haven't heard this before, I should point out that fruit flies are specially bred for studying everything from viruses and diseases to genetics and medical treatments. It's hard to find any research more geared towards the public good. So with that benchmark of stupidity to beat, let's look at some of the stupidest and funniest scientific conclusions made by politicians. <laughs> Yes, we are going to start with the low-hanging fruit. President Robert Mugabe gave us this insight into Zimbabwean politics when he believed a woman who said she could conjure diesel from a rock. In 2007, he dispatched three nicely dressed government ministers to witness a demonstration, and sure enough, they reported that it was all true. As you can imagine, crude oil, better yet, Refined diesel oozing out of a rock would be the answer to Zimbabwe's fuel shortage. So according to press reports, Mugabe gave the woman a million dollars to conjure up even more diesel from other rocks. Now there are two possibilities here. Either this is a magical process that could turn Zimbabwe into a net exporter of diesel fuel for the whole continent, or it could be an elaborate hoax, with a hole drilled into a rock leading to a pump and a tank of diesel. It's a toss-up! Hard to say either way. OK, turned out it was a tank of diesel being pumped through a man-made hole, but it could have been the answer to Zimbabwe's fuel shortage, so let's not make a complete donkey's ass out of President Mugabe. We'll put his magic fuel from rocks idea quite low on the list. On to the next one. People outside the United States might not be familiar with Congressman Todd Akin, who four years ago revealed to the world the amazing science that stops rape victims getting pregnant. From what I understand from doctors, that's really rare. If it's a legitimate rape, uh, the female body has ways to try to shut that whole thing down. Having failed to explain the technicalities to one TV journalist, Akin tried it with another. Stress plays some part in fertility. Perhaps you know some people, they wanted to have a a child and they couldn't seem to do it so they adopt somebody and then pretty soon the woman gets pregnant because there isn't the stress. Ah, I see. So the medical doctors you're quoting determined that a woman who was under stress when she got raped wouldn't get pregnant. Which means that those who did get pregnant either weren't really raped, they made the whole thing up, or they weren't under any stress when they were raped. In other words, they secretly enjoyed it. It's beginning to sound less like something you learnt from a medical study, Todd, and more like something you heard in the locker room during football training in high school. 
Are you sure you don't want to have another shot at explaining this scientific theory? I'm not setting myself up as a, a medical doctor or anything. Yeah, it's just something no that shit. has been a long... And there are a whole series of studies. Great. Well, off you go and get them, while I entertain my subscribers with a popular selection of London Tea Room dance melodies. <laughs> Sorry, I can't wait any longer, Todd. You don't have any medical studies, do you? No, that's what I thought. So let's see if we can track this myth down. His source was probably an obstetrician called John Wilkie, who first came up with this argument. He's written quite a bit about the capacity of the female body to shut down a pregnancy when raped, and he told the New York Times how it's done. Now, he's an obstetrician, so obviously an expert. And here's his study. An expert and a study. Potholer, I hear you cry. What more do you want? Well, as I've pointed out many times in my videos, science is not determined by the opinions of experts. It's determined by what's been published in respected peer-reviewed scientific journals, set against what else has been published in respected peer-reviewed scientific journals. And Wilkie doesn't even pass the first hurdle. He may believe this stuff about spasming fallopian tubes, but belief is not science. He's never published any studies outlining his research, his methodology, his experiments, his sample sizes, or anything that would allow peer reviewers and other researchers to evaluate his conclusions. This study isn't a study. It's something Wilkie published in a book. Now you know why I'm always banging on about not believing the science you see in books, blogs, videos, newspapers and on TV unless they cite peer-reviewed scientific papers published in respected scientific journals. You could so easily end up with a jury believing that this nonsense is real science and acquitting a rapist on the grounds that his victim got pregnant. Fortunately, Aiken was booted out by voters before his wacky conclusions took hold. Thank goodness none of the other ideas on this list are life-threatening. You see, when you ask the question, does HIV cause AIDS? The question is, does a virus cause a syndrome? Oh, damn it, South African President Thabo Mbeki. <sighs> With this statement, Mbeki took charge of a government that promoted herbal remedies to treat people with AIDS instead of retrovirals that might have saved their lives. How does a virus cause a syndrome? Well, perhaps if you read a medical textbook or asked someone who's published studies on the subject, you'd find out. But no, Mbeki was getting his information from the internet. And the blogosphere is full of claims that HIV doesn't cause AIDS, along with a coterie of experts to back them up. There's Peter Duisberg, a professor of molecular and cell biology and Kerry Mullis, who won a Nobel Prize for his work in genetic PCR. There's a group of doctors in Western Australia. None of them believes HIV causes AIDS. But once again, winning a Nobel Prize or being a distinguished professor doesn't mean that any sound that emanates from your anal sphincter must be a pearl of infallible scientific wisdom. Most of these beliefs don't pass the first hurdle because they're published in blogs rather than respected peer-reviewed scientific journals. And although Duisberg has published papers, they've been drowned out by the wealth of evidence coming from studies that show a very clear link between HIV and AIDS. It seemed to me that we could not blame everything on a single virus. A Harvard study concluded that the South African government's denial of the HIV-AIDS link led to the deaths of over 300,000 people who didn't get the treatment they needed. When I was compiling this list, I thought, eh, some politician somewhere is going to be dumb enough to repeat the internet myth that vaccines cause autism. So why not Google vaccines, autism, politician, and see what comes up. Two and a half years old, a child, a beautiful child, went to have the vaccine and came back and a week later got a tremendous fever, got very, very sick, now is autistic. Her little daughter took that, uh, took that vaccine, that injection, and she suffered from mental retardation thereafter. Yeah. You see, the thing is, 
Uh, it's sort of like me saying that last week my son had the MMR vaccine and a week later he finished first in the 100 metres race at school. Obviously, that would mean vaccines improve athletic performance. Cause and effect need a correlation, and that means taking large sample sizes and analysing statistics. Now, there was a peer-reviewed study that purported to show a link between vaccines and autism, so that passes the first hurdle. But it doesn't get past the second because it was found to be heavily flawed. It was redacted, and every other study shows no link between the two. So the only place you'll find this claim is where politicians do most of their reading on science, which is the internet. I won't go into the details of why this is junk science, because you'll find a complete debunk of this internet myth on my channel. And while we're on the subject of Michelle Bachmann, here's something else she had to say about science. I don't think that it has been established yet as a fact that global warming is the issue of the day. And, and I think that at this point, one thing that we need to do is look at the science. Funny, because I thought looking at the science was the job of scientists. It's not the job of politicians to look at the science for a very good reason. Very few of them have the time to read through the scientific literature, and even if they did, they wouldn't understand it, because few of them have any scientific training at all. If you think I'm wrong, just keep watching, and you'll see probably the most woeful examples of politicians trying to play scientist, and showing just how ignorant they are. As far back as 1863, Congress realised that an understanding of the increasing complexity of science was slipping beyond its cognitive grasp, so it decided to establish an advisory body of scientists. It's called the National Academy of Sciences, and it's the Academy's job to explain scientific conclusions published in the scientific literature to politicians. But these days, politicians don't want to hear that. They think they're smart enough to figure it all out for themselves, even if that means getting all their information from blogs, half-remembered junior high school science, and going on a crash course in remedial geology. There have been these back and forth between uh, on glaciers and the melting that we've seen over and over again. Uh, why did it happen then if these same factors that you're blaming it on didn't exist then? Um, I can give you as much or as little answer as that you would like. Um, give me 15 seconds. Please. Okay, g give me 30 if I may. Yep, you've got 30 seconds to educate me in a field of science that usually requires a three-year degree and a basic understanding of physics, which I don't have. And so Richard Alley has to explain the Milankovitch cycles and the concept of insulation and positive feedback using his head and his bald spot to represent the Earth and the South Pole, respectively. And when the 30 seconds is up, of course, Senator Rohrenbacher still doesn't understand it, so it must all be wrong. Let's leave the remedial class and see how politicians are getting on in the other class for those with learning difficulties. I, I, I live in Wisconsin. You know, th there were, two, I think, 200-foot-thick glaciers in Wisconsin. W w how do you explain that the it's climate a, it's change a, before, it's before a, man ever had a carbon footprint? How, how do you explain that climate change? The that you just made is blatantly false. How do you we explain, do know. We how, don't. how do you explain climate change that occurred... 10,000 years ago before man had a carbon print. Oh. <laughs> Which is science speak for, are you really that stupid? For anyone who thinks Senator Johnson makes a good point, listen again. He's not making a point. He doesn't accept the science, so he's asking a question which he thinks will have these researchers stumped. If he really wants to know what causes glaciations, all he has to do is read a science book or have a scientist come to his office and explain it. Or watch my video on the 800-year lag explained, where I show that deglaciation was caused by a wobble in the Earth's axis. That caused a small increase in insulation in the southern hemisphere, which led to increased water vapour, lower albedo through melting ice, and the degassing of carbon dioxide, which in turn led to more warming. You're welcome, Senator. So who else wants to turn a congressional hearing into a remedial science lesson by attempting to stump the teacher? The lead scientist at NASA said this. He said that what ended the ice age was global wobbling. Is the wobbling of the Earth included in any of your modeling? And the answer was no. When you have a model and you say we're going to leave out the most important impact of that model out of our theory and not talk about global wobbling, 
How can you make projections? Well, Congressman, it's like this. Global wobbling, or the Milankovic cycles as they're more commonly known, take place over the course of hundreds of thousands of years. Their effect in the space of a few decades or a few centuries is so minimal as to be totally ineffective. But again, Congressman Stockman's complete ignorance on this subject is a given. It's not the point. The point is he makes the assumption that the science must be wrong and he's convinced his questions will have all these know-it-all scientists stumped. They can't possibly have seen the flaw he spotted. Oh wait, I've just been told that Stockman has managed to spot an even bigger flaw in the theory. How long will it take for the, for, for the uh, sea level to rise two feet? I mean, think about it. If your ice cube melts in your glass, it doesn't overflow. It's displacement. I mean, this is the thing, some of the things that they're talking about mathematically and scientifically don't make sense. Uh, I think what you mean, Congressman, is that they don't make sense to you. And why should they? You're a politician with a bachelor's degree in accounting. Don't assume that because it doesn't make sense to you, it doesn't make sense to anyone who studied science past 10th grade. No, scratch that, even 2nd grade kids understand it. So it's hardly surprising that research glaciologists and oceanographers spend their entire professional careers understanding it. Now there is the teeniest possibility, about the same odds of diesel coming out of a rock, that in the course of a hundred years of research, not one single oceanographer or glaciologist realised that ice melting in a glass of water doesn't raise the level of water. It's possible Congressman Stockman in his spare time has discovered something completely unknown to science. Or it's possible these oceanographers and glaciologists know something that Stockman doesn't. It's a toss-up! So instead of giving Congress the benefit of his theory... It might have been better to go over to the remedial class at the Committee of Science, Space and Technology, and Stockman could have asked why it makes sense to scientists and not to him. He would have been told that melting ice already in the ocean is not the cause of sea level rise. The cause of sea level rise is partly due to ice melting on land and pouring into the oceans to the tune of 150 cubic miles a year, and partly due to the thermal expansion of the oceans as they warm up. The problem is that this failure to understand the science not only leads these politicians to conclude that the science must be wrong, they figure that the only way thousands of scientists can be wrong is if they're all in on a conspiracy. And if there's a conspiracy, then the politicians can happily ignore the published science and make up their own. It's like a downward vortex of ignorance, stupidity, paranoia and religious conviction. Now, you would have thought that Stockman's ice-in-a-glass theory would rank among the stupidest ever uttered by a politician. Well, it's got to be up there, but there's a lot of competition. The, the temperature on Mars is exactly as it is here. Uh, nobody will dispute that. It could be secular. It could be just a shift on the axis. The ice caps are melting, which we see over and over again. Yeah, they're melting on Mars, too. Uh, one would have to say the Great Flood is an example of climate change. Yes, he really is talking about the well-known scientific fact that Noah led all the animals two by two into an ark. This is his crucial piece of evidence that carbon dioxide can't cause atmospheric temperatures to rise. And that certainly wasn't because mankind had overdeveloped uh, hydrocarbon energy. No, it was because an invisible being made it rain for 40 days and 40 nights and flooded the entire world and, by the way, left not a trace. Which brings me neatly onto the number one wacky idea politicians have about science, that it's all bunk because we were in fact created 6,500 years ago. I've come to understand that all that stuff I was taught about evolution and embryology and Big Bang Theory all that is lies straight from the pit of hell. Over the last hundred years, geology, astronomy and biology have been under attack by American politicians who want to influence how these subjects are taught. Not according to discoveries and conclusions published in the scientific literature, which is how it's done in the rest of the world, but according to the politicians' own beliefs. The battle began in the 1920s when several states banned the teaching of evolution and it's still going on today as they try to push creationism into science classes. It's difficult to know how much this literal belief in creation is fueling the anti-science movement among American politicians. 
I never ascribe motivation, because I can't read people's minds, but often they make the link themselves. Todd Akin's remarks about rape victims not getting pregnant were used to justify refusing abortion to rape victims, and his strong anti-abortion views were in turn shaped by his religion. This guy, who was chairman of the House Committee on Science, Space and Technology, refused to accept that carbon dioxide affects atmospheric temperature because, because we can't control what God does. Now, I've restricted my list to the English-speaking world and to advanced democracies, but you might well ask, why are most of the people on Potholer's list conservative American politicians? Yes, good question! I'd like to know the answer to that too. It's certainly not because Americans are dumb. After all, this is the land of technology and innovation, which has produced some of the greatest scientific minds of our age. And it's certainly not because conservatives are scientifically illiterate. Far from it. In other advanced democracies, like Europe and Japan, conservatives are just as accepting of scientific conclusions as any other part of the political spectrum. I found examples of politicians on the left fudging the science. That's in my videos. But I haven't come across examples of them refusing to accept the conclusions of researchers or trying to substitute their own science. So don't blame me. American conservatives themselves see this as a battle between liberals, people on the left who accept the published science, and conservatives who don't. I've instinctively known this from the get-go from 20 years ago. The whole thing's made up. And the reason I know it is because liberals are behind it. Conservopedia thinks evolution, plate tectonics, black holes, dark matter, and just about anything in the realms of science are part of a liberal plot. For politicians to echo these beliefs, well, it's a situation that conservatives in other parts of the world find bizarre. Being a conservative means believing in free markets and minimising the role of government in the economy. It means defending individual freedoms from the power of the state. It means individual responsibility and accountability. It means a lot of things that have been expounded in conservative creeds from various think tanks and individuals. It doesn't mean rejecting scientific conclusions or making up scientific facts to suit your ideological or religious beliefs. That's never been a conservative principle. It could be just a shift on the axis. So here's my advice to American politicians who don't seem to be on board with the bipartisan approach to science adopted in other advanced democracies. Your job isn't to do a 30-second crash course in a complex scientific subject, and when you don't understand it, decide to make up your own science instead. Your job is to decide what policies to implement based on scientific conclusions that have been published in respected peer-reviewed scientific journals. And if you don't know what those conclusions are, ask the scientists doing the research, or the institutions that have been set up to do the research, or the National Academy of Sciences that was set up to advise you what those conclusions are. Don't have a scientific hearing and call another politician as your only witness. Don't ask busy researchers for a 30-second crash course in basic physics so you can decide for yourself whether their conclusions are right. But as you sit there in your chair with your data, we sit up here and ours with our data and the constituents and stuff behind us. You don't have the basic scientific knowledge or the time to understand it all. Your job is not to pick and choose which bits of science you want to accept based on your ideological or religious beliefs. So if you don't want to impose a carbon tax, then vote against it. Don't use the excuse that the science doesn't make sense to you, and therefore it must be wrong. And if you want to vote against legalising abortion for rape victims, then be honest and vote for that. Don't invoke some scientific claptrap about how women who get pregnant haven't really been raped. And if you want kids to learn your religious beliefs, fine. Be honest and vote for a bill that mandates that. Don't give your religious belief some pseudo-scientific title, then pretend scientists are divided over the issue so that both sides need to be taught in school. In other words, don't make up your own science or hide behind pseudo-researchers who've never published their beliefs simply because real scientific conclusions might lead to a policy you don't like.